Good afternoon. Apologies for the mistake. Um, hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about business transformation today. And uh, before I get going, I just want to put a disclaimer that uh, the opinions are of my own and not of J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and I won't be able to talk specifically about what we do at J.P. Morgan, but I will talk about kind of our thinking behind what we do. Um, so, in summary, we're living in exciting times, right? And we're also living in challenging times. And the pace of technology that uh, is, is increasing exponentially. This is all stuff that you know. Um, but in terms of business transformation, it, it's literally defined by Wikipedia as making fundamental changes in how business is conducted uh, in order to help cope with the shift in market conditions. Uh, I would add the term drive market conditions because we're trying to think about how to be ahead of uh, certain market conditions before they adversely impact the firm. And so the kind of out of the box advice is pay attention to the market conditions, but also innovate so that you can get ahead and define how the market will exist. We've been driving two major innovations in our organization. Uh, one is around machine learning, the other one's around cloud. Uh, and my team in particular has been working specifically with natural language processing capabilities uh, on unstructured text and unstructured data. So today I want to talk to you about you know, some historic examples of uh, innovation in finance. Uh, what were the drivers? What were some of the results? Uh, and some lessons learned along our particular journey uh, and some up and coming technology that, that we think is interesting and, and could be potential market movers. So in the financial services industry, I'm going to touch on three major entities, as we call them, uh, that drive some of the innovation that we are trying to implement. Uh, one are customers. Their expectations and demands uh, are more uh, impactful and more demanding than they've ever been before in terms of data, uh, data quality, data security, uh, analytics. Uh, the regulatory environment, their requirements are becoming increasingly invasive into our business, uh, rightfully so in many cases, protecting consumer data, privacy, and security, uh, but also making sure that any decisions made by whether it's people or technology is not impactful to the market or global economy. And lastly, technology. Technology uh, has been transforming how we think about business and the most recent investment in the fintech industry is definitely eating away at some of the core revenue uh, lines that any bank or financial services company uh, is, is used to. But the interplay between those entities is very powerful. When we think about how technology intersects with uh, consumers or customers, how con customers are often uh, assisted by regulators, uh, and how the bank must kind of dance between those three parties or entities to deliver value for both our shareholders and our customers. And part of our journey as, uh, as an organization within the bank is to accelerate those capabilities so that the tools that we build enables us to be more effective and more lean and more agile in the future. So some historic examples, I'll go back a while to the 1940s and you know, this is around the time when credit cards first came uh, to bear, uh, technology called or card called Charge It, um, started in 1946 by John Biggins. And the early cards were for customer loyalty and then they morphed into short term lending and other forms of payment. And some of my colleagues here from different companies like Capital One and others are uh, probably familiar with, with this history. But, but most importantly, it speaks to creating value and not waiting for the market to determine uh, what a company will do, but creating value by using technology to drive new solutions. In the 60s, we saw the ATM, automated teller machine, uh, first deployed in Japan, called the computer loan machine, actually, uh, which had a three month cash advance of 5%. And I think we're seeing a lot of those uh, come back in terms of fees and uh, all types of charges that you, you receive uh, at different ATM machines. So it's, it's funny how, how things come back around. In, in 67, uh, technology called Bankograph um, was for after hours cash distribution, an early form of ATMs. And when I looked at the image of that device, it actually looks almost identical to uh, ATMs that we're seeing today. So 
Um, in the financial services industry, uh, the pace of change and innovation is fairly slow compared to other markets. But today, credit cards are a, literally a digital extension of yourself. You know that you, you know, credit cards are often used for not only payment, but also in some cases, validation of who you are. Uh, and, and that authentication has been driving uh, data and data solutions going forward. In the 70s, the automated clearinghouse, um, basically replicating the uh, clearing process of checks between banks, uh, bringing to uh, the market a new form of automated clearing through electronic process. And today, there's over $40 trillion per year in ACH, both deposits and credits uh, performed globally. Uh, shortly after that, the, in, within the New York Stock Exchange in the 70s, a designated order turnaround or super dot was created uh, that helped route orders electronic, electronically to trading posts. Again, the emergence of more electronic and digital uh, uh, transactions within the financial services sector is beginning to take hold and more and more data is being created around those transactions that need to be analyzed. In the 2000s, we saw several pivotal technologies that revolved around financial decisions. The previous technologies really dealt with how business processes can be automated, and those successes led to lots of internal business changes. But effectively, it, it didn't really deal with looking at the intelligence of the data that's been generated. But in the 2000s, we saw quant trading become you know, very popular very quickly using mathematical algorithms to calculate trading decisions. Uh, high frequency trading shortly after uh, improved at a rapid pace the ability to uh, predict market changes, uh, but also trade in short term patterns within those market conditions. Uh, peer to peer networks or peer to peer payment networks, uh, things like PayPal and others, uh, innovated on how we exchange money. Um, and then lastly, gaming and gaming currency, so in the form of bitcoins and others, has, has definitely trans, transformed the market. So in today, 2010 and until today, uh, you know, big data has hit finance. I think all of the major banks that, that we've talked to have some kind of big data strategy or big data architecture that's being planned or implemented. Um, I think in, in some of my conversations, there are banks at first at its infancy and other banks at more an advanced stage. Um, I think the, the benefit that the banks are seeing is the ability to be able to process massive amounts of data that I like to call that's beyond human scale. So the traditional data warehouses of, of, of the past, uh, vendors who I, I won't name, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, are tend to be now legacy systems. And these things could have been designed less than five years ago. So when we think about where big data is going uh, in the next two years, I think we're going to see dramatic transformations in how we store data, how we process data, how we analyze data, and how we share data. So some of the lessons that we've learned, and, and I'll share five particular points, and then uh, we can go to questions. Um, within your organization, it's important to see the common threads that would drive transformation. Uh, so first, once you have identified that, define the opportunity statement with your stakeholders and partners uh, this was very important, some of the programs that we worked on, because uh, to one degree, it can be fairly intimidating for an innovation organization to literally dictate what an operational organization or a business should be doing with technology. Um, so you, you, you have to get buy-in, uh, and you also have to make sure that you don't impact the operations of the business. Partners involved, um, making decisions on who will be your both internal partners and external partners is very critical. Um, but some of the problems that we saw that we needed to address was antiquated technology. Uh, as I mentioned before, technologies that have been around for decades that haven't been changed or transformed. Um, paying to receive or process data that we could not process or other banks could not process. And unable to deliver on regulatory requirements because maybe they were too impactful to the business, would cost too much, require too much manpower. Many reasons drive the importance of bringing multiple stakeholders to the table. Second, visualize and prototype an end state. I think it's critical, and I try to do with my team, 
uh, not just your MVP, your minimally viable product, but try to visualize several options beyond that, several solutions beyond that. Because what you'll find is that as you go into development and you build your solution, whether it's data-centric, uh, application experience-centric, you will often need to repeat that conversation multiple times, and you also have to lay a vision out for multiple stakeholders. And in parallel with doing that, be able to generate enough interest and enough funding to go ahead and get your projects done. The third point is addressing what can be built internally versus what must, must be bought. Um, we, do not, we are not a software development company. We're an organization within a bank that tries to uh, accelerate development. Uh, and then with the benefit of both internal use and possibly potential external commercialization, um, be able to kickstart new ideas and new concepts that will come to market and partner with the right external partners to bring it to, to bear. So it's not always a, a, a build mentality. It's sometimes it's a build and buy or build or buy. Uh, but either way, definitely having those potential partners and stakeholders at, at the table is important. On the question of shared IP, this is something that's very critical, especially in the data analytics space. There is so much information that's unknown about the data that we started to analyze, and I'm sure in your case as well, that you don't know what you don't know until you actually do the work. Well, you want to make sure you position your organization that the IP generated out of that is maintained within your organization and not sold to the highest bidder. Fourth, disrupt but manage your risk daily. Uh, we are a regulated business, and jeopardizing data, data security, data privacy, customer information, uh, what we call PII, personally identifiable information, is just off the table. We cannot sacrifice customer information at all. So uh, you can disrupt, you can go after your goals and your projects, but within the boundaries of protecting the customer's information and the security of the firm. Lastly, fifth is execute and deliver best-in-class user experience. I think gone are the days that you know, the just good enough experience is what you get out the door, even to internal stakeholders. We are working with design firms and or hiring UX, UI designers to uh, tell the story of the data that we're analyzing. So you can be an outstanding data scientist and put together the best visualizations uh, possible. But if you cannot interlink the story of the data to the business problem, point number one, then you haven't completed your mission. So we really feel that having a great experience is what is expected by all stakeholders and customers. So we're familiar with many of the bigger innovations in the industry. Tesla has innovated. You know, the automobile turned it into an app. Um, Apple has innovated the, uh, the phone or the communication device. Facebook transformed relationships. And I would even argue Apache has transformed software development in terms of open source. Um, but up and coming technologies and capabilities, particularly within the finance world, are, are very exciting and will definitely open not only new opportunities for the banking sector, but new opportunities for businesses that depend on the banking sector for payments and payment transactions. Machine learning clearly is one of those things, and I think this entire two-day conference has been phenomenal in both explaining the core technology behind it and why it's important, but how you can apply it to your business, uh, as well as unstructured data analytics. The majority of data science work that has existed in our organization was purely around structured uh, text, it's structured data, so transactional-based data. Uh, so what we've really delved into is unstructured, right? The documents, the e-communications, the, um, the files, audio, video files, other things outside the, the scope of transactional data. There's a lot of opportunity there that you should definitely unleash. Then lastly, I mentioned before, Bitcoin and blockchain technologies uh, is presenting huge, huge opportunities in the financial services sector. And I think there's a lot of excitement around uh, what is possible in this space, and in fact, which is public knowledge, JP Morgan has purchased uh, or actually built a company called Digital Assets looking at this space. Um, so for the next several years, you'll definitely see innovations, I think, within all banking sectors around uh, currency transformation. 
So that's my chat for today. Uh, I'm, I'm open to questions. Um, if you have any thoughts or ideas, uh, I'd love to share as much as I can. So uh, let me turn it over to Kerry or someone with a mic. Thank you. If, okay, there's one question. Is that a mic? That's cool. Okay, that's a good one. So uh, thank you for that. Now, it's yeah. for the Vision 2020. So we are seeing that data is exploding. I mean, it's a known fact. And the bank is witnessing, you know, they are the center for the digital transformation. They're seeing it across. How does, what are the innovations you are looking in for by 2020 on the data analytics capability that is going to make your banking much more easier and better for the consumers? What are the type of innovations you are focusing on down the line for five years from now. And so that as a tech, a tech guys like us, yeah. we are prepared for the futures to meet uh, to your demanding needs. Okay, good question. I can't say that I'll answer all of them because uh, some of it is, is proprietary research that we're doing, but I can say generically, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, blockchain technology is definitely um, uh, on the roadmap. Trust networks are, are very important in various use cases. Um, biometric authentication is, is something that's also very interesting and definitely will you know, leverage uh, uh, machine learning capabilities. Um, I, I, I think in addition to those two areas, uh, there is a lot of um, space clearing, I would say, in the retail space. And, and what I mean by that is the, the future of branch banking will definitely change. Um, I, I can't go into much more detail than that, but. Uh, the consumer space is, is exploding, obviously, in mobile and online web uh, and transforming in the local branch uh, experience. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.